Okay. So then, here's the rules for the fence method. Rule number one, you choose the model with the minimum dimension, right? So that's because that's the, your criterion, the optimality. Well, so then you say, what if there are ties? Okay. In some cases, you could end up with more than one model within the fence with the same dimension. So the, which one you choose? And then you say, OK, in that case, I choose the model that fits better. Make sense? Yeah, so they tie it in terms of dimension, both in the fence, and I pick the model that fits better. OK, so that's the rule number two. OK, okay now if you stay with this, with, uh, stay with this rule, it turns out that uh, no matter how you choose this cutoff, okay, you can choose it adaptive. You choose it adapt adaptively, as I showed you with that little uh, curve, in which you can you, you can end up evaluating many different cutoffs. But only a few mo models are possible results of a selection. Okay, so you look at all the models. I'm telling you, only a few models even have a chance to be selected. They say, who are these lucky guys? Well, uh, here's an example. Uh, suppose the maximum dimension of the candidate, mo candidate models is 3. Okay, so you only look at models up to dimension 3. Okay, so now, uh, here's a, I'm used this, using this notation, mj to be the model with dimension j, such that um, this measure of lack of fit, this model minimizes the measure of lack of fit among all the models with dimension j. Okay, so, so that's the mj. So basically, you see here, because uh, all my models have dimension at most three, okay? First, I classify them into three groups, models with dimension one models with dimension 2, models with dimension 3. Okay? Uh, among each group, I'm going to pick the top candidate according to whoever does the best in terms of model fitting. Okay? But here, you only compare models with the same dimension. Okay? So there's no such problem that you have to choose between a model with 3 dimension and a model with 100 dimension as in my earlier example. You don't have to worry about that because everybody has the same dimension. Okay, it's easy to pick the top guy, okay, whoever does the best in terms of model fitting. Okay? So you choose those guys. So these are the night lucky guys that I mentioned. Okay? The, other, the other guys don't even have a chance. Okay? So that's, that's the point. Okay? So, then, so that's easy enough. Because sometimes you, you, it's a lot easier when you explain things in terms of common sense. But once you have to write out some mathematical formulas, it becomes a long expression. So let's just skip them. <laughs> All of these things say the same, uh, do the same thing as I just said. Okay, so as I said, the other guys don't even have a chance. So all these guys have, these are the only four models that have chance to be selected as the optimal model. So now your job seems to be a lot easier, right? From maybe choosing from hundreds of models now down to four models, okay? So the still the question remains, which one? Okay, because so you want to choose one model, not all four of them, okay? So who is this lucky guy? Well, uh, to solve this problem, we use the idea of the adaptive fence. Remember this little curve I showed you? Okay, the idea is that you calculate the empirical probability that each model is selected. Okay? Whoever has the highest empirical probability, and that's the guy. That's the lucky guy. Okay? And here you got four models, right? You can also calculate the empirical probability for each model, and whichever whichever has the highest empirical probability is the model you select. Okay? So this idea is very similar to the adaptive fence, which I like to skip. Okay, this tells you how to compute this empirical probability. If I have, if I have time, I can explain it a little more. But you can also read this paper, uh, this 2008 paper. It, uh, illustrate this uh, this idea of the adaptive fence. 
Okay, so now here's, here's the, 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 the link between this, uh, this method I just introduced uh, with a fence method. You see here, we don't seem to have a fence, right? Where's the fence? You, 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 you've picked the model that fits the best within each dimension, then you calculate the empirical probability. It doesn't seem to have, to have this fence inequality involved anywhere, right? So why is it called a fence method? Is, is it still called a fence method? Well, um, it, it actually, the reason is it actually uses implicitly, implicitly the principle of the adaptive fence So uh, for such a reason, the new method is called invisible fence, or IF. So once again, let me uh, rephrase the link between this invisible fence and the original fence method. So the idea may be interpreted as finding the model that has the best chance to best fit the empirical data when controlling the dimension of the model. Okay, so it has the best chance to best fit the empirical data when controlling the dimension of the model. So this, this last sentence is important because if you don't control the dimension of the, uh, if you don't control the dimension, then the largest model always wins. Okay, if you don't control the dimension, whoever fits the best, the largest model, you always fits the best, therefore always wins. However, if you control the dimension, it's a different game. Because this same idea has been used um, uh, in many other model selection criteria. So this is consistent with the principle of the adaptive fence, provided that the minimum dimension criterion is used in selecting the models within the fence. Okay, so, so this is basic. This is a brief description of the invisible fence method. Okay, now I'd like to apply the, uh, this method to the microarray gene set analysis problem that I uh, discussed earlier. Um, so, you know, remember we have this, uh, this measure of lag of fit, okay? So basically you want to say why you can, so here's a, so the first question you want to answer. So how do you connect model selection with the gene set identification? Okay, so where's the, where the model? Right, so that's one thing. Another thing is uh, what is the measure of lack of fit here? Because what, what is the measure of lack of fit here? Okay, so before I answer that question, let me point out a one special case, which is when there's no parameter involved under the assumed model. Okay, so the general form of this measure of lack of fit allows you to involve three things. One is the candidate model. So this capital M represents the candidate model. And the Y represents your data. And this here theta M is the <coughs> parameters under the assumed model. Okay, so under this model, these are the parameters. So this candidate, this measure of lack of fit can involve three things. But in some cases, it doesn't depend on any, any parameters, such as in our case. So in this case, the calculation of this measure is a lot simpler. Okay? Now luckily, in the, for the gene set analysis, it, it belongs to the last case, where it, it doesn't involve the, the parameter theta m. Okay, now here's the, the, the next question. Now how do you define a, how do you define a, a, a model for gene set analysis? Now here's an example. Suppose there, sorry. Suppose there are M gene sets under consideration. These are the candidate gene sets, okay? And these gene sets are denoted by the numbers from one to M, okay? So then you say, what is a model? A model corresponds to a subset of these numbers. Okay, so any subset of these numbers correspond to a model. And for example, one three is a subset, and okay? That means you, select, you would identify gene set number one and number three as your uh, differentially expressed gene sets, okay? So any subset of these M numbers is considered a model, okay? So a model corresponds to a subset. So then models, uh, the, the, you know, subset selection becomes a model selection. Therefore, gene set identification becomes a model selection problem, okay? This was the original idea that uh, proposed by Dr. Rao. 
Um, okay, so, so that's the idea. Um, so in this case, a model is completely specified by the subset, and there's no other thing involved, such as parameters. There's no parameter involved. Okay. Now here is a, a, a practical problem that we have to solve before we do anything. Because we, the, the, our intention is a model selection for high dimensional data. And this is a particular case of high dimensional model selection problem. So for that kind of problems, the number one issue you have to deal with is computation. Okay? Here's, let's just, just consider one example. Okay? Remember that paper I just I mentioned earlier about uh, the 2005 paper, okay? in which they have an uh, example that um, involves 522 gene sets. Okay? Now, if you have to consider all the subsets of these 522 gene sets, the total number of subsets is 2 to the 522. Okay? That's an astronomical number. Okay? So how can you afford to evaluate such a huge number of uh, gene sets? Okay? Because you, you, you have to e evaluate this measure QM, right? You got 2 to the 522 evaluations. Okay? So, so that problem you have to solve, right? So, so that's why the, you know, the, you know, whenever, whatever you do, you have to f first you uh, answer this question. Um, yeah, so that's the one I just, just talked about. Uh, 522, yeah, so in 522, and you, you get, uh, let's say, okay, here's a little, little calculations. If you're just gonna consider all the, mod, all the subsets that, has, that have two gene sets, okay, so k equal to two, the total number is uh, 135,000, okay? Sorry, 136,000. So now you say, okay, what if I have to consider all the models with three gene sets? Well, th the number increases quickly, okay? That's right, so then you say, okay, if I have to consider all the subsets, then you get a two to the five twenty-two. that's what I mentioned. Yeah, so how do we solve this computational problem? Well, here comes a, uh, one uh, an advantage of the fence method that is you, you remember this measure of lack of fit QM right 